What is up, everybody? This is Bill Pesco Salido, and this is another episode of Real Talk with Bill and Michelle. I am very excited to be here with you today. It is Friday afternoon, April 19th, and we are going to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is content marketing, but specifically blogging, and even more specifically, today's topic will be four powerful strategies to help you start writing blog posts like the pros. Now, as you're coming out onto this Facebook Live, feel free to <clears throat> write below something. Let me know what is up. Hey, Tannis Lee, yo, good to see you. Uh, but just drop a, a little note below, say hello. Let me know where you're watching from, how you're doing, and what is it like in your part of the world today? I know right here in Frisco, Texas, it's a beautiful day, um, not really warm, it's like 70 degrees or so, but really gorgeous. And I hope it's awesome where you are as well. But again, just drop uh, a note below letting me know what it's like, where you are, and uh, where you're watching from. You know, are you in Cleveland? Are you in Boston? Are you in Detroit? Are you in LA? Where the heck are you? Uh, hey, Lorinda from North Carolina, what is going on? And Suzanne is watching from Los Angeles. I'm sure it's probably really beautiful there where you are, Suzanne, so that is awesome for you. Now, uh, I want to, I'm gonna die, I'm really fired up for today's training just because this is really important, right? And the reason why today's training is so important is because where we are here right now in 2019, for good or for bad, anyone can have a blog, anyone can be a blogger. Now, the great thing about that is that from a technology standpoint, it's not really hard to set up a blog. You don't have to be a tech wizard, you don't have to be like a computer nerd, you don't have to be a web designer or anything like that. It's pretty easy to just get a basic standard blog up and running, or uh, it's, there's a lot of different programs out there that have a blog. So if you join like their training and their platform and their system, a lot of them have a, a blog program that you can have as well. Um, and, and that's great, right? Because here we are in 2019, blogging is an amazing way to build your brand, establish that no like and trust factor, uh, establish yourself as an authority in a specific topic or niche or field. And it's a great way to attract people to you, to generate leads for your business to get customers uh, for your business, to get sales for your business and make money online. So blogging is great in a lot of ways and it's so many, it's such an asset to have a blog and uh, if you can get good at blogging, no matter what the topic is, it's just a great way to help build your business, your brand, everything. That being said, the challenge is that because it's relatively easy, relatively inexpensive uh, to set up a blog and to be a blogger, everyone and their brother is doing it, right? I mean, this is not like back in 2005 or 2008 where, you know, being a blogger wasn't a thing yet. I mean, people were bloggers, but it wasn't, didn't nearly have the, the, the notoriety, notoriety or the name recognition. I mean, people weren't really going around saying, I'm, I'm blogger like they do today. And the challenge with it today is that it's such a crowded place. It's a crowded space. I mean, the internet is really crowded in general. Uh, we're already being bombarded with, I've read so many different reports and, and studies, but anywhere from four to 7,000 uh, um, uh, you know, images, uh, ads, distractions per day, right? Four, say from 4,000 to 7,000, uh, different things like, you know, banner ads or advertisements or just th these distractions coming in, taking our attention away from whatever it was that we were intending to do every single day. So the internet's already crowded. And when you have uh, upwards of about 300 million blogs online today, and that's a rough number, it might be more now, but 300 million blogs online, you got to be good, right? You've got to, more importantly, you've got to capture your audience's attention, capture your reader's attention, and not only grab them right away, but keep them reading, all right? Because there are so many distractions. Uh, if you, even for a nanosecond, 
start to bore your reader, they're going to hit the back button. And they're going to hit the back button so fast and so willingly because they know, hey, this, this, this blog post, it's a dime a dozen. There's probably 10 or 20 or 30 others on the same topic or similar topic that if this one's boring me, I know there's a whole bunch waiting for me as soon as I hit the back button or as soon as I do a Google search. So are you with me so far? Does that make sense? And if that is making sense to you, uh, let me know. Just say yes below. And I want to uh, recognize a couple people have popped on. Uh, Tan is Lee's wearing shorts. Nice. Ma hey, Monica, what is going on from Miami? I'm sure it's probably really nice in Miami. Uh, Terry Smith is in Lava Hot Springs, Idaho. Uh, oh, and by the way, Monica, thank you for sharing uh, that thing you shared on the new Facebook algorithm change in the Power Players Club Facebook group. Uh, if you don't know Monica, she's one of the many Power Players Club members that we have, and she shared, um, I guess, an update, if you will, about how Facebook is, is now changing their algorithm a bit to try to uh, limit or rule out if you are going to in now uh, lives like this right here, trying to uh, bait people into commenting uh, or bait people into sharing, basically baiting people into engagement of any kind. So you might notice I'm gonna be, be kind of careful with what I say to you all today when we're interacting because there's certain things now that Facebook will have like a voice recognition uh, component within their algorithm that will say, so if I'm like blatantly trying to get you to whatever, you know, C-O-M-M-E-N-T, I guess I feel like I'm talking to my dog now, um, to get you to C-O-M-M-E-N-T uh, down there, which I normally would just say that willingly, they're now, um, I guess, tracking that or monitoring that and it could be problematic. I don't know what they'll actually do. Maybe they'll just give this like no love or, or engagement or reach um, or what the deal is. But uh, anyway, thank you, Monica, for sharing that uh, in the Power Players Club Facebook group. And for those of you that don't know, uh, Power Players Club is our weekly training that Michelle and I do. We go deep, deep, deep uh, into different aspects of Facebook marketing and everything that revolves around Facebook marketing, writing copy for Facebook ads, creating content for Facebook ads, Facebook ads themselves, building your brand through Facebook, you name it, everything. We do it every week, so uh, feel free to uh, go check out the Power Players Club. And uh, also, let me know, am I coming in loud and clear? I've got my Yeti mic here that I'm using today, and I have a new uh, little camera. I'm not using the computer camera. I've got a new, uh, whatchamacallit, whatchamadoodle camera on top of my computer that, we, that Michelle got and just arrived today, and I'm test driving it right now for the first time. So let me know how I'm looking here, if it's clear, if you can hear me all right. Um, and Susie hopped on. Hi, Susie. Susie Ann. And uh, yeah, Monica, yes, we need to tell you what we think from now on. Yes, I'm just going to like through osmosis, just be like, tell me what you're thinking. Um, but yeah, that's actually a good way to say it. Instead of saying the former version, C-O-M-M-E-N-T-B-E-L-O-W, I'll say, uh, share with me your thoughts on that. How about that? Um, okay, so are you with me? Are we good to go? I am fired up and uh, excited to be here, like I said. So here's the deal. Because it's such a crowded marketplace, because there's 300 million plus, give or take several million, blogs online today, you can't be boring, right? You have to engage your readers right away. So what is the best possible way to engage your reader? Like the first possible thing your reader might see when it comes to your content, specifically blog posts. Uh, what do you think that is? I want you guys to, to let me know. What would be the first thing that a reader uh, would see that's going to make them decide to uh, want to click forward and read your blog post or make them decide, nah, I don't really feel like doing that. I've got other things to do, all right? So asking that question to you all, what is the first thing that you as the publisher, the author, the creator of this blog have the power to control right away that will, help, that will either really get your reader to read your blog post 
or might make them be like, nope, not interested, not for me. I don't have time for this. I'm moving on. What do you think that might be? I want to hear you. Lorinda says the headline. Anyone else? Susie Ann, headline. Yes, anyone else? Tim, hey Tim, good to see you here. And said I'm loud and clear, awesome, awesome. Anyone else? Lorinda, Susie Ann, anyone else think it's the headline as well? Uh, well, Susie Ann says, or an intriguing question. So the very first thing, no, you were right the very first time, you guys were right, the headline. All right, the headline of your blog post, the headline of your email for that matter, the headline of a blog post, headline of a sales page, headline of a video that you might do. The headline is the biggest thing that's going to make someone be, say, either in their brain say, oh, okay, yes, this is for me, or no, it's not for me at all. I have no interest in that. Or yes, this is kind of for me, but of all the choices I have, is this the one I want to read? Or they say, okay, that topic is what I'm interested in, but that headline's not really grabbing me, right? So let's say it was a headline on blogging and I, instead of um, four powerful uh, strategies to uh, improve your blogging skills so you can start writing like a pro today or something like that, what if I just said uh, a handful of ways to become a good blogger, right? I mean, one's much more powerful and intriguing and compelling um, that has like, you know, power verbs and, uh, and leverages, you know, thing and I'll get into the details, but you know, you can have a good headline or a bad headline that's on the same exact topic. And the person might be like, man, eh, that this headline's not grabbing me. Um, it's kind of like the, the checkout counter. If you're at the grocery store, you all shop, right? You guys all eat food. I'm guessing, uh, you go to the checkout counter and they have all the magazines there, right? And what is like the most famous magazine, especially, I mean, junk trash magazine, but famous for headlines, the National Enquirer, right? The National Enquirer, I mean, they're hilarious, you know, like Hillary Clinton eats Martian baby or whatever, you know, uh, Obama abducted by aliens and returned back to earth. And, you know, he's no longer Obama, like whatever. They have crazy headlines. You've seen them, I know. Um, but even, you know, Men's Health, uh, Cosmopolitan, 17, like just think of all the magazines, uh, Vogue or whatever. Um, the headlines are what are going to grab us, like literally grab our attention. And in that split second, that, you know, nanosecond of time, those two, maybe two, three seconds at tops, we're making these decisions and we're sitting there deciding like, ooh, does that, is that intriguing me? Or, nah, do I just buy some Tic Tacs instead and, and go about my day? So uh, headlines are massively important and people get paid a lot of money just to make headlines. Newspapers and magazines spend a ton of time and effort just on the headline because they, they know like, look, we need to get readers and the headlines on the cover are what's gonna get readers. So you, you have to understand that your content behind the headline right? The content of your blog post might be incredible. It might be phenomenal. It might be like the best stuff ever. But if you've got a poor or a lackluster or just a meh headline, people aren't going to bother even getting the chance to see how great your content is because you, they, you lost them at the headline. So the first thing, the number one thing, if you want to start writing like a pro blogger and you want to start getting more people to read your stuff, which means they'll then uh, become familiar with you and your brand. They'll start to know, like, and trust you. They'll now have opportunities to opt in because you, of course, have a lead magnet with your blog post. If you want to get all these things to happen, you're getting more leads, getting more customers, building that brand, it starts with the headline. I mean, no questions asked. It all starts with the headline. So uh, what would be a couple different headlines? And I've done a lot of headline training in the Power Players Club. In fact, I've got in about maybe two weeks from now, I've got a whole nother training just dedicated to headlines uh, teed up. I've, I've been thinking about this and marinating uh, about this one for a while. But there are three main types of headline, uh, one of which I used in today's thing. Actually, let me show you today's headline of this. OK, 
Okay. Um, okay. So that was today's headline. Four powerful strategies to write blog posts like the pros. All right. So three different types of headlines. And if you if you know what they are, or if you can tell by this headline, uh, you know, comment. Oh, I can't say that. Uh, let me know what you're thinking uh, beneath this box that I'm in here. All right. Does that work, Monica? Uh, the first type of headline is what we call a social proof headline. All right. This is basically where you're leveraging and piggybacking off of someone else's authority. So, for example, uh, how to how to build a startup business uh, like Richard Branson. Right. Um, how the Kardashians are able to uh, shed pounds leading up to all of their weddings. Right. Because there's someone one of them's always getting married. Or how do the Kardashians uh, lose all that baby weight after they're you know squirting out all these babies that they have. Things like that. You're leveraging the authority of someone else. Uh, another aspect of social proof headline would be using like numbers, like volume. Uh, you know, like 25,000 other people uh, can't be wrong. Check out our new software by right? implying that they have 25,000 you know, customers. Uh, so social proof headlines um, are really, <clears throat> really, really powerful because human nature, none of us want to be usually the first one to do something, right? Uh, you don't necessarily want to be the first one to dive in the pool. You don't want to be the first one to, 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 you know, step out into a risky situation. But if there's, if there's proof that lots of other people or a very famous person uh, has also done this already, or is also doing this as well, it just naturally drops that, that resistance that we might have to be like the fear of being the only one. And it now makes it entirely much more socially acceptable. It kind of validates our decision. And so here's a couple examples. Um, you know, here's a trick that is helping thousands of people do blank, right? So these, these, you know, here's a weight loss strategy that's helping thousands of people lose those last 10 pounds. Uh, the number one secret to doing blank that all the cool kids are talking about, right? Something like that. Uh, or you know, how to blank like the pros. In this case, it was how to blog like the pros. I'm leveraging the pros. First of all, there's a number there because you're thinking lots of pros are doing it. But I'm also piggybacking off the fact that if a pro, a professional is doing it, well, wouldn't you want to be like a professional versus an amateur? So, you know, if it was how to, how to, you know, uh, how to you know, drive a golf ball like the pros, well, geez, I want to have a, a drive, you know, golf swing to drive much like the pro golfers do. So leveraging that. Does that make sense? And uh, so you guys get the social proof, leveraging social proof in a headline concept. And if that does make sense, you, I would like you to use the digits on your hand to signify uh, in, a, in a manner of speaking uh, beneath me where there's little boxes that you can type within, right? Again, I can't say, it's like Voldemir. Remember like in, in Harry Potter, like he, sh he who shall not be mentioned whenever they're talking about Voldemir. That's how I feel like this is now. Like I can't even say it, I can't even talk about it. I've got to like use all these abstract other ways to describe it. But yeah, uh, write stuff beneath uh, if you're on board, if you get that, if you get the social proof concept and if you've used that before as well, Eric's laughing. Yeah, and Eric, you may have came on late. You know, it's been determined now that Facebook, and for anyone, that, that Facebook has changed their algorithm or algorithm around now so that they can voice recognize on Facebook lives like this. And they're trying to prevent engagement baiting, so whether that's comment baiting, share baiting, uh, using like the um, emoticons, whatever, baiting people into doing that, like basically asking for that engagement. They want it to be just very organic and natural. So where I would normally say to, you know, blank below, I can't do that now, apparently. Otherwise, like lightning will strike through my roof of my office. Uh, <laughs> hey, we got uh, Mark Harris is in the house. Monica says, use the buttons to the left to show your love. <laughs> I like it. That's funny. That's good. Good, good. Um, so then we got uh, 
so then we have, uh, so that's number one is social proof. Then number two is a threat headline. Number three is a gain headline. So threat headline, uh, so we're basically now working with strong emotional triggers, right? Um, people want to avoid pain. So if you can have some kind of pain avoidance within the headline of your blog post, excuse me, people are gonna like that. So for example, you know, uh, how, to avo how to avoid the five biggest blogging mistakes, right? Uh, do not run another Facebook ad until you first watch this video. Um, you know, the ugly truth about blank, you know, the ugly truth about network marketing, you know, something like that. Uh, it's, it's uh, you know, people want to go towards pleasure and they want to move away from pain. So uh, saying things like, you know, mistakes uh, or how to avoid uh, things along those lines, because people will be attracted to that because they want to know what not to do. So that's a great way using the threat headline. Uh, and then the opposite to that is the gain headline. So again, people want to move towards pleasure and away from pain. So the gain headline is getting them towards pleasure. Uh, again, then there's an, um, an emotional connection here, emotional triggers that go on with these pain uh, avoidance versus the gain uh, getting towards headlines. So uh, a gain headline example might be uh, how to build a business that you can be proud of. Um, fastest way to achieve fill in the blank, whatever, the fastest way to lose 10 pounds, the fastest way to get your first 1,000 blog subscribers, uh, the fastest way to make your first $1,000 online using Facebook, right? That would be gain. People want to move to, because people like want to know, like, I want to know, um, you know, how to, how to lose 15 pounds without working your butt off, right? It's kind of actually a little bit of both. It's kind of going towards like, hey, I get to lose 15 pounds, but it's a being, able to, a being able to avoid uh, working your butt off. So how to you're drawing them towards pleasure while you know they're avoiding pain at the same time. So writing these attention grabbing headlines is critical. I can't tell you how critical it is. And here's the funny thing. And I used to be like this so bad. I was the biggest uh, uh, example of doing it wrong. I would spend a ton of time on a blog post. Uh, same thing with emails. And proportionally, I would spend like then a, a, a millisecond on the headline. So if I spent, you know, uh, an hour writing an email, I would spend like 30 seconds on the headline. Or if I would, you know, over the course of a few days, write a blog post, I would come up with a headline in like three minutes because I would think of it as an afterthought. Right? I was the biggest victim of this or not victim. I was the biggest, uh, with, I can't even think of the word I'm trying to say. Um, but I was the biggest violator of this, right? The biggest perpetrator. Uh, I spent hardly any time on headlines in relation to the amount of time I spent on the content itself, which is wrong. Now, I'm not saying that if it takes you over the course of three days to write a blog post, that you should spend three days working on a headline, but you really need to, to invest a good amount of time uh, and effort into the headline because it is so important. So uh, brainstorm, right? Br write down a bunch of different ideas. Don't just do the first one that pops off your head. Uh, you know, write down several different headlines and then massage them, tweak them, uh, you know, play with them, really work around. Maybe start replacing words with, with you know, if you have like five or 10 headlines, start kind of mixing and matching and, and see what uh, comes out the best. What one you feel is the most attention grabbing because you're doing yourself, your business, your brand, everything, a huge disservice if you spend a lot of time on this really good blog post and then dismiss the headline as an afterthought. Because I'm telling you, people, if they see a headline and they're like, nah, they're not going to stop. It's not going to stop them in their tracks. It's not going to get them to click to read more. It's just not. And then you're going to have a really great blog post that never gets read. And who wants that? So... Um, Susie Ann says, same here. It takes me long to come up with my headlines. That's fine. That's great. Um, using the, those, uh, those three headline examples though, these different types of headlines and using, you know, the, the formula, the examples I gave you, uh, should help out a lot and just, you know, and, and run your headline by a friend, a family member and just be like, Hey, what, what do you think? You know, do you like this one better or that one? Like I'm always like before I'm sending emails out, almost all the time I'm 
I'm uh, messaging Michelle. And I'm like, this one or this one? And I'll give her like two or three different headlines. I'm like, which one of these three? Because I would have sat there and looked at them so much that like, you know, sometimes you get so close to your content that you need someone else's, another pair of eyes to take a look and give you some really good feedback. Uh, so does that make sense? And if it does, uh, incorporate your digits into communicating that you're in agreement by using a three letter word that begins with Y. How about that? Um, okay, so let me see, what else do we have here? So Eric says the 80-20 rule, the 20% you spend on the headline gets you 80% of your results. Yeah, it's a good way to look at that. Um, let me know if you all uh, like what Eric just said by indicating such with the, by communicating words via your computer onto the screen. <laughs> yes, Eric says that. And look, there's, there's my main man, Eric David Duncanson, the 80-20 rule. So, okay, so that was uh, numero uno. And so if you liked that, uh, type a numero uno in the comment sectione. Maybe if I say it like in poor Spanish, they won't know. Like the commento sectione. Like they won't know what I'm talking about. The Zuckerberg translate. Um, okay, so numero dos. If the headline is number one, which it is, the most important thing. Number two, and number two is like, it's really like 1A and 1B. If headline's 1A, this is 1B. And we have some, uh, nice, we have some yeses and Cs and numero unos coming over. Very cool. Uh, so if headline is 1A, the introduction is 1B. All right, so the number two thing you can do to start writing, uh, creating blog posts, start writing like a pro, is to work on your introduction, write better introductions. Because it's the similar concept as the headline. You could have this amazing blog post, but if you have a meh headline, people won't read it. With the introduction, you already sold them on the headline, right? So think of this almost as like a, a mini funnel in a weird way. You're, you're just taking them from step to step to step, right? Or I should say step to step to step. Headline, got them. Now they're still though deciding. Again, the internet's a busy place. People are busy people. We have a lot going on. We also have a lot of distractions. We have ads hitting us all the time. Uh, we have TVs going on. We have you know probably three devices at any point in time. Maybe you have a desktop and a, and a, and a phone. Maybe you have a, an iPad and a laptop. Uh, and maybe you have a laptop and a desktop and a phone. Like me, I have my, any given day, I've got my desktop I got my laptop, which I'm looking at you right on now, and I've got my phone right here. And at any moment, the calls start like blow, like blah, 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 like with notifications. And I'm willing to bet that that's probably similar for you. Maybe not exactly like that, but probably somewhat the same. Let me know if you agree. Uh, if you kind of have a maybe more than one device uh, on you at a time, or at least when working. And if so, are you could is it easy to get distracted? Right. So. Uh, the second that you are no longer captivating them or the second that you're boring your audience, they're gone. They're gone. They're out of there. You know, something from Mashable just popped up, right? An ESPN notification came up. Uh, you know, CNN just popped up. You know, the, the cathedral's burning down. Like, whatever. If you're not, like, pulling them in constantly in an effort to keep them engaged, keep them reading, keep pulling them in, is a very good chance you'll lose them. And it's the easiest thing. All they have to do is click the back button and there's a, a sea, an ocean of other stuff that they could be reading instead, okay? So your introduction is critical. So what are two things that an introduction needs to be? Does anybody know? Eric says, yes, easy to get distracted by multiple devices. Totally. Um, what do you think an introduction needs to be? I'll tell you. It needs to be short and punchy. It needs to be curiosity inducing. Now, and it starts right from the first sentence. 
All right, you immediately, because again, people, they're literally, as they're reading, as your readers are reading your blog posts, especially the introduction still, what they're subconsciously doing and as they're reading is they're also deciding, is this for me? Is this blog post really what I thought it was going to be? Is this cracked up to what the headline you know, said it was gonna be? Because the headline's making a promise, right? So is this actually fulfilling what I thought the headline promised for me? Um, is this boring? Is it all of a sudden they're talking about themselves? Like, you know, is it? Because they're your, your readers are always thinking uh, one big thing, and that's what I call WIFM. It's an acronym, which stands for what's in it for me, okay? Uh, almost the entire time they're reading your blog post, subconsciously they're thinking, what's in it for me? Meaning the reader, like for them. They're like, why am I still reading this? No one allows themselves to get bored online. All right. You, know, you might you might have to suffer through a boring conversation at Thanksgiving with that crazy uncle or that you know relative of yours. You're just like, oh my god. All right. You might sit there and suffer through that and be bored throughout Thanksgiving dinner. You might have to go to an event and, and one of the speakers is really boring, and you just sit there and you still listen, but you're bored out of your tree. Okay. But I'm telling you, no one gets bored online. They don't allow. No one. You just don't allow yourself to be bored because there's so much stuff to be doing instead. I mean, even if you're gonna still sit there and be a couch potato, which if that's what you're doing, it's fine, but you're not gonna read something that's boring to you when you know there's a million other things that you could be reading uh, or looking up or searching or Googling or checking the scores on or whatever. People do not allow themselves to remain bored online the way that you might, to be polite, be bored listening to that stupid person's conversation at the cocktail party, right? So the second that you're boring, they're gone. They're gone. That's it. Click the back button. There's a million other things waiting for them to read instead. So that's so they're constantly thinking this. What's in it for me? So one of the things I see people do, which always makes me cringe a little bit when reading blog posts, is first of all, the introduction, it doesn't really have a defined I mean, it has a very defined beginning, right? The first sentence, but it doesn't have a defined end, right? You, you want to create a blog post that's almost in the way a book has chapters, right? Chapter one, and then you know, I just finished chapter one, now I'm on to chapter two. Okay, chapter two, that was pretty good. Chapter two ended, now I'm moving on to chapter three. Just like a book has chapters, a blog post has to have these sort of defined beginning and ending sections throughout the blog post. And the introduction is, is, uh, is, that includes the introduction as well. Now, obviously, the opening sentence, the first sentence is the beginning of the introduction. But I've seen these introductions that just kind of go and just meander and kind of go and go. And, and, I, and I'm reading this. And I'm like, am I still reading the introduction? Or are they already in like the meat of the blog post? I don't know. I can't tell. And so as a reader, when you, when you don't have those, those definitive, like, okay, this section ended, now we're moving on to like the first point. Like, let's say if it was a blog post on five ways to do blah, right? How to, how to, you know, five strategies to blah, blah, blah. You're going to expect to have five specific strategies to do blah, blah, blah. Am I right? Uh, indicate suchly in agreement, if you will, in the section below via typing with your fingers, if you agree. Um, so you, you need to have a introduction that's short and punchy that pulls them in curiosity inducing the most important sentence, your blog post is the opening sentence. Uh, and again, I did a, a training on this in the power players, I think two or three weeks ago, uh, where I showed like opening sentences, opening, you know, the very opening line of emails, the opening line of blog posts, how to actually pull people in, draw them in. And it's critical. Uh, because it's like you almost like have to keep selling them on why they should keep reading. All right. So that first sentence, that introduction, uh, make it short and punchy. Get to the point. Make it about them, too. I was on a copywriting training yesterday and uh, they were they were they asked us what they, they did. They had written a series of copy for a big time marketer who had launched a product recently. And they did all like the, the email marketing, all the email uh, follow-up, you know, for this and like the webinar the copy for the webinar registration and basically the copy for everything. And they said that there was one word in particular 
that was used 5% of all the words that they've used in the entire email series, the entire sequence and the entire everything webinar registration. There's one word that was used 5% of the time. Now that might sound like small, like 5%, but think about like, that means out of every word possible, this one word was used the most. It was used 5% of the time. Can you guess what that word might've been? And type below uh, or indicate suchly, indicate your intentions to participate thusly uh, by utilizing your digits on the device that you're watching on. Um, and let me know if you know what that one word is that was used by far and away more than any other word. And it was actually used 5% of the time in all of their copy. One word, what do you think it might be? I'll give you a hint. Some of you have actually written it already in the uh, word typing section that's below. So let me know if you think Eric, Eric David Duncanson, my main man, he nailed it. Pedro, hey Pedro, what's up? Pedro nailed it too. The word is you or any variation of that, your you will like a contraction, you will like you will. So you, your, you are, you know, you possibly are your, uh, your as in like your business, your as in you are about to, uh, you will or you'll, any variation of you. That is the most important word. That was the word that was used 5% of the time more than any other word out there, you or a variation of it. And so the challenge that I see with a lot of blog posts, especially in the beginning, is that the author immediately starts talking about themselves, and immediately starts talking about their struggle and immediately starts talking about how they wallowed in crapulence forever. And then, you know, whatever, then somehow they meander their way into the blog post. And I kind of get why they might do that. It's kind of like, well, I wanted to share a story about myself so that they could see that I've been there and done that and uh, down in the dumps and worked my way out and so forth. And, Okay, but A, that's, I don't know if that's really the best thing to do in a blog post. B, certainly not the best thing to do in the beginning of the introduction of a blog post because if, if you sit there and just start talking about yourself and you're saying me, 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 I, 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 the person is gonna be like, bro, like what about me? Like no one cares about you more than they care about themselves. Like we all have our own self-interest in mind above and beyond anyone else's. Now, I don't mean to say like, as a parent, you have your own self-interest in mind versus over your children. But I'm talking like, if it's like you're reading a blog post or if you're online searching for something or you're trying to get an answer to a question, your own in that moment self-interest is far greater uh, than the, the author and what they had to go through. Like we don't care because we're always thinking what's in it for me? How can this help me? Is this really what I was looking for? Will this answer my question? Will this help me out? And so if you, the author, now if you're the author and all you're saying is like, I, and then I did this and then me and me, and then, then I went down and then I got up and da, 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 the reader is going to be like, ah, so use the word you or a variation, your, you, you will, you'll, you are, you are, um, more, uh, don't use I and me and, uh, a little trick too, it's a copywriting hack. Um, and this goes for email as well as blog posts or just copy in general. It's going to sound weird and you're going to be like, Mer? but uh, start each sentence and you can kind of revamp it. You can tweak it. You can revise it, of course. But if you start every sentence with the word you, you're going to draw your reader in, right? You're going to be writing for your reader. Now, obviously, if you literally started every sentence with you, 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 it would look weird, right, over time. So that's where you can kind of massage it and tweak it um, and or just realize, okay, maybe not every sentence needs to have you in it. But if you just go in the mindset of writing the word you or a variation at the beginning of each sentence, you're going to write for your reader. You're going to pull them in. You're going to let them know that you're thinking of them, that you're writing for them, that you're here to help them that it's not about me, it is actually about you, all right? So a bad introduction is gonna go down this, this pit of tell, you know, the wallowing, and, and I struggled, all these reasons, a, lot of, a bad introduction is gonna go on and on and on. 
and not really have a clear defined ending before you segue into like your first talking point. Uh, a bad introduction will not will have a very lackadaisical or, or passive opening sentence. Um, a bad introduction will have zero curiosity uh, involved in it, right? And I don't want you to write bad introductions. I want you to write good introductions. I want you to hook your readers in. I want you to get your readers to want to keep reading more and more and more, right? So that's why you've got to really write good introductions, short, punchy, to the point, curiosity inducing, and hook them in right away by using the word you or variation. Does that make sense? You guys getting this? If so, uh, indicate suchly with uh, a keystroke from your computer using a word in the English language that rhymes with mess. <laughs> How'd you like that one? Awesome. And Pedro, what's up, buddy? How's it going, man? So Mark says, you sounds like a great strategy. Yeah, totally. Um, Eric says also by using you, your more, oh, by using you, you're more likely focusing on your avatar. Yes. Good point. Well said, Eric. And uh, let me actually undo, let me do this. I'm going to put something up here. Boom. A little crawler going along at the bottom there, or I could just do this crawler. I like this crawler. All right, um, Susie Ann, she's with me, Eric's with me, very cool, you guys are awesome. Okay, so that was number two, all right? And you could even type a two below if you are on board with that strategy, if you were, or are in favor of that strategy, and if you could see yourself using that strategy moving forward, and being serious, like if you could see yourself doing this, like this stuff isn't hard, it takes practice. But it's not hard. It's not hard like trying to learn, you know, advanced biochemistry. It's not hard like digging ditches. Uh, but it just takes practice. It takes a little time. It takes a little effort. And it takes thinking about it and working through it. But it's not hard, right? There's some things out there in life that are actually really, really hard. This is just something that's going to take a little bit of time. And trust me, trust me, uh, when I first started blogging, or I wouldn't even say I was blogging, I was just like, slapping together blog posts. Um, they were bad. <laughs> like, I don't think that my, I don't think necessarily that my writing skills, I guess they've gotten better, but like, I mean, you know, I first started blogging, you know, it was uh, 2011, right? I mean, 2011, I mean, I was still about as smart as I am today. It's not like I was a child and I was still learning how to write. Like, I, I think that brain capacity-wise intelligence, I'm relatively the same as I was, uh, you know, nine years ago, eight years ago. Um, but my blog posts were just so bad. And mainly they're bad, not because I was not a good, uh, not as good of a writer, but it's just like, I just didn't know what I was doing. I didn't have any formulas. I didn't have any, I hadn't seen a lot of people doing it right. I hadn't taken any training yet. You know, so I just didn't really know what to do. So I was just kind of like typing words and sentences and stuff and thought it was good. But if, as I look back at them, they sucked. They were brutal. I'm, I'm embarrassed by them now at the work that I put out then. But, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And so but, but my point is, is that you don't think to yourself, oh, well, I'm never going to be a good writer or I'm not a good writer. I'm only an okay writer. You got to be a really good writer to do that. Like, no, you don't have to. It's not like you have to be Ernest Hemingway. You don't have to be, you know, Mark Twain to write good blog posts. You just have to take some time and practice it. Like I just got, the reason why I got better, well, yeah, I took some courses. I've invested a lot of time and effort and energy into it. Um, but the main reason why I'm so much better now than I was then is because I've just done it so much. I've just done it. <laughs> I've just like practiced and implemented and actually taken action. I've just written a ton of blog posts. And so I just have naturally gotten better and you will too. That's what I want you to, to leave here knowing. So let's move on to uh, the third thing. And so let me help you out here as far as introduction. A cool thing that you can do um, and you can do this in an introduction. You could actually do it really at any point in the blog post. Um, 
And uh, Pedro, I'll get back to that in a second. Um, do you all know what an open loop is? Let me know um, by indicating suchly beneath me um, in the section where people are known to type things. Do you know what an open loop is? Have you heard of that term? Uh, if, if yes, great. Uh, if no, I'll explain it. Um, no big deal if no. Um, but if you know what it is, if you've used them, if you know what an open loop is, just simply you know, let me know your thoughts on your awareness of them. Um, Eric says, yes, very cool. And the reason why I want to know is because I could either go and ex just kind of explain it a little bit or not at all. If everyone knows what an open loop is, great. But if some of you don't, it's important because I don't wanna, okay. Hey, Lenny, what's up? Good to see you here. Um, okay, so an open loop is a, okay, so we got like half yes, half no, it's totally cool. Uh, an open loop is, in essence, it's like a pattern interrupt. It's it's a cliffhanger, so to speak. So I'll, you, you know what an open loop is in the sense that you've seen these a million times, right? Usually every time a TV show cuts to commercial break, they'll end kind of like with the like dun, 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 and they cut to commercial break, and that's an open loop, right? They're, they leave you kind of hanging, and you've got to, that's why you suffer through the commercials, where nowadays you fast forward through because you DVR'd it. And you want to get right back into the action, but they do that by design. Um, uh, oftentimes they'll end the episode with an open loop. Like they'll end it where like they don't answer, they, they, there's something is still open. Like an open loop is because there's a question there that they didn't give you the answer to, right? And a question might be, did the person survive or not? Or, you know, what's going to happen? Like what's their fate going to be? And you have to wait a whole week until the show comes on the following week. Right, that's an open loop. Now, the biggest open loop in TV history uh, is from the show Dallas, not the modern version that was probably really crappy, but the one back in the 80s. And it was the Who Shot JR episode. Because I don't know if you all remember this, and let me know if you do remember this, because if you do remember this, you'll know exactly what an open loop is. Basically, JR Ewing, the main character, uh, at the very end of the episode, at the very last episode of the season, he got shot. And two things happened. A, if I recall correctly, A, you didn't know who shot him. That's why the whole thing, who shot JR was like this massive thing. But B, it was kind of like his, his life was on the line. Like you didn't know if he was going to survive. Um, so it, they made you wait an entire season, right? An entire season before you got these answers, before you got the answers to these big questions. More recently, I don't know if there's any Game of Thrones fans. My absolute favorite show right now, Game of Thrones, it was at the end of season five, I think, where uh, the main character, Jon Snow, was stabbed a bunch of times, like stabbed by his, by his compatriots, the, the Night's Watch uh, up on the wall. And it just ended. The, and the season ended with him just like with all these stab wounds and he's laying there on the ground, kind of like gasping for breath, like you think slowly just dying away. Um, and that, and then the, the season ended and we're all just like, what the, <laughs> like, are you kidding me? You can't end it like that. And we had to wait, whatever it was, eight months or nine months or who knows how long it was back then until season six started. Okay. So that's an open loop and you can do it with much less drama and without having them people wait like months to, to, to close the loop. You can do it in your writing. Right. So uh, a, a great example is um, so how, how about this? So um, I'm going to I'm explain to you what an open loop is. But first, I want to share with you something else. Like that right there is an open loop. Like I'll get back to the open loop. I'll get back to explaining the open loop and giving you training on open loop. But first, I want to talk about the, the fourth thing uh, in uh, of the four steps to writing like a blogger. And that is blah, blah, blah. Right? I open that loop. I kind of made that, you know, um, planted that question in your brain and then specifically didn't answer it, moved on to something else, but you still have that question lingering. And so from a brain standpoint, our brains are wired. We want closure, like scientifically wired to, to get the answers to questions. We want to have that closure so we can move on. When you open a loop and don't answer it, that we're not getting that closure. 
right? We're not getting that. And so what happens is tension builds. Now, if it's just like in an email that you're writing, we're not talking like massive tension. We're not talking like stress and drama, but like literally if that, if that you plant the seed, you open up that loop, uh, you open that question, don't answer it. The brain is craving the closure. They want the answer. Our brain wants the answer. We're not getting that answer. So as a result, there is tension. But the good thing about tension is that tension creates attention. And so the person, the reader, is going to keep reading intently so they can get to the answer, so they can get closure to that answer, so that they can then move on. So when you introduce an open loop, uh, and this can be done in an email, this can be done in blog posts. I do it in blog posts a lot, especially at the end of my introduction or somewhere in the introduction. I'll, I'll create an open loop that I won't maybe answer until maybe midpoint in the blog post because I want to create that open loop. I want to create that tension because I want them to keep reading because they're reading intently. They're like, okay, I got to keep reading. I want to find out what the answer to that thing was. Um, so there's so open loop is a great way to <laughs> an open loop. Uh, sorry, I just read one of the comments. Um, yeah, Pedro says the Bachelor TV show does that very well nowadays. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're totally right. And I, I know this not because I watch Bachelor intently every single week, always. Um, I do actually. It's my guilty pleasure. I hate to admit it. Like literally Bachelor, Bachelorette, anything like that is my guilty pleasure. It's so I feel ashamed admitting it, but it's true. I literally am like glued to that show. Partly probably because I live with three women, you know, Michelle and two girls. And they're all into that stuff. So we kind of have to try and find common ground, things that we can watch as a family. And Bachelor, Bachelorette, that's this is what my life has been reduced to. I watch a lot of reality TV shows. Anyway, as I digress. So, um, and Pedro also said in regards to an open loop, yes, it triggers your brain to seek or look for the answer. Absolutely. So, um, uh, and it can be as subtle as, like, so let's say in, a, in the blog post, um, you know, so I'm going to share with you uh, five tips to blah, 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 blah. But, but before I do, uh, I want to share with you this quick story. Right. You've opened up. They want to get those five uh, tips to blah, blah, blah. But in order to get to them, they got to listen to you tell that quick story first. Or, you know, so in today's blog post, I'm going to share with you uh, the three fastest ways to get to a thousand blog subscribers on your blog. Um, but before we dive into that, uh, I want to share with you this. Right. You've literally opened that loop. And so now, the, again, the brain is waiting to that for that closure um, before before they can move on. Right. So it's a great way to get their attention, to hook them in and to keep them intently reading, because, again, a lot of blogs out there, 300 million blogs out there. The internet's a busy place. They're getting bombarded with ads and distractions. You've got to do everything you can to hook them in and keep them engaged and keep them reading. All right. So if that makes sense, if you like that one, uh, indicate thusly uh, beneath the existing words that have been typed and let me know. And do that by, uh, by using the Digit on your finger to depress the number three key, all right? So the number three key on your keypad, depress that with your digit and do it down that way. Get it? Um, let's see. Uh, Lenny says he remembers the, oh, the, the Dallas. You remember Dallas? how they did that. Who shot JR? Um, Pedro says, uh, LOL, LOL, me too. I'm hooked with my wife. It's my only show I watch though. <laughs> uh, and lots of threes. Uh, Eric wrote uh, un, deux, trois in Francois. You could write trace. Uh, uno, dos, trace. Okay. So the last one, uh, is the close. All right. So you've got, you've got a headline, you've got your intro, you're then going to have talking points. And, and by the way, I go through all of this in enormous detail. Um, in this blog post, I have this ultimate blog post formula guide 
that I want you guys to go check out. Excuse me. I don't know if that was illegal to say on Facebook now what I just said, but um, be smart and learn more stuff by acquiring my uh, ultimate blog post writing formula. And the link for that is scrolling right now. So onlinewealthpartner.com forward slash blog post formula. Our website and blog is onlinewealthpartner.com and then just type in forward slash blog post formula. You can get access to the ultimate blog post writing formula. It's going to help you out a ton, right? So the last thing is, is the close, right? At least as far as what we're talking about today. Number four, numero quattro is the close. Um, a lot of people, a lot of blog posts I've read, believe it or not, it's, it's almost like the whole thing is like this one big stream of conscious thought. It's like a journal entry or a diary entry. It's just like, you know, today I went to the store, blah, blah, blah. And they just like go on and on and on. And it's tough to know when certain parts stop and when another section starts and so forth. But the, a big mistake I see people doing is that they don't have an actual close or conclusion to the blog post. Now, a close or conclusion, it doesn't have to be anything massive and dramatic and that gets them to stand up and applaud and give you standing ovation. It doesn't have to be like that. If you can make it that way, awesome. Bonus points. Bonus points for you. Good job. Great. But you have to at least have a close. You have to let them know that this is, it is now ending. It is now ended. And what I like to do, if you, if you're struggling for a close and how to close the blog post out, right? And, and you want to get them now to take, to, to take that next step, which is the call to action. Presumably you've got some kind of an offer or a lead magnet that you're, that you're, that you have within the blog post to promote that you want people to, you know, go check out. Right? So, um, if I'm just stuck for a conclusion, I'm like, I don't know. Um, I'll just recap what I wrote in the blog post, like a little summary, right? So if it was, you know, seven ways to blah, 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 blah. I'll just say, okay, hey, now in conclusion, um, so as you probably now know, there are seven ways to blah, 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 blah. They are, and I'll just list them numbered, like number one, blah, number two, blah, number three, blue, number four, blah. And I'll just, you know, list them out. And then I'll say, you know, some final sentence like, so if you really want to get good at blah and you're still struggling to do blah, make sure you use these seven blah, blahs to help you blah, 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 blah. And, and then if you really want to get good at blah, 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 you know, check out this ultimate guide to blah, blah, blah that I have. And that will be the lead magnet, right? So it's very important though, because again, people, we, we crave that closure and it's going to be annoying to people, especially if you want anyone to come back a second time or a third time or a ninth time to read more of your content, right? So if you want them to be any kind of a repeat reader of, of your blog posts, if you, if you end blog posts and it just kind of feels like it's falling off a cliff or just like going down this hill and you just don't know it's, it's ending and just sort of like ends, it's not going to be good for repeat visitors, right? You might get someone or a lot of people to read that one, but if they're like, eh, it just kind of felt weird, like no closure. And then they see later on a second blog post of yours that you're promoting or running an ad to, or you emailed your list. Hey, I wrote this blog post. They're going to have second thoughts because they're going to think about the last time that they read your blog post and it's just kind of like withered away at the end, right? So make sure that you, I even say, like I'll even say in like for the conclusion, which is usually just a paragraph, right? Maybe two paragraphs, not a lot, but I'll even have like the, the header tag, like the H2 tag will be uh, my keyword phrase. And then I'll say final thoughts or my keyword phrase colon conclusion uh, or the keyword phrase uh, colon next steps. Right. So it's kind of letting them know in, in the subheading of this final paragraph or two that this is the conclusion. But then I actually conclude it uh, with the final call to action uh, to the lead magnet or the, the offer that I had uh, that I was promoting within the blog post. So uh, just make sure that you always have a conclusion. And again, it doesn't have to be this rousing. They give a standing ovation type thing that's like, oh, my God, that's so amazing. That conclusion. If it is that great, but just have some kind of a conclusion to let people know that this has come to an end and that now there is a next step, which is because the really next step you want them to take is to take the next step to opt in to your lead magnet. Make sense? Cool. So 
as we conclude this, uh, the four powerful ways to start writing blog posts like the pros is one, write compelling headlines that, that promise something. Uh, number two is introduction, short, punchy, um, to the point, uh, it, you know, curiosity inducing introductions that use the word you uh, quite a bit, as, at least as much as you can without seeming ridiculous. Uh, the number three thing is incorporate open loops within your blog post to, to hook them, to keep that attention, uh, you know, to create that tension so that you get attention, to get them to keep reading intently uh, on your blog post. And then lastly, have a conclusion of some kind that lets them know, it kind of summarizes what they just read and segues them, transitions them into taking that next step, which is to opt into your lead magnet or to check out your offer. So I hope this made sense. I hope you guys all liked this training today. If you did, you know, let me know in some way, shape or form. Uh, uh, what was it, Monica? What did you say earlier I could say? Um, indicate your uh, appreciation by depressing keypads, you know, the keys on your keyboard or uh, pressing little colored face people with your thumbs and let me know that what you thought, if you liked this. Um, and uh, thank you, Eric. He says, excellent training, great, great value. Also, you can, you know, feel free to tag anyone if you think other people that you know might like to see this. Let them know. You can either uh, just make them aware of this. You could uh, write their name and tag them. I don't know if I can say that or not. Um, all sorts of things. So, um, Lenny Boucher, wow, thanks. Just what I needed. Very cool. And remember, Bruins game five tonight. I know. Hey, I didn't know you were a Bruins fan as well. Uh, yeah, I'm. the only thing I'm slightly torn is, is that Celtics is like probably overlapping. So I'll have to record the Celtics, watch the Bruins first, and then I'll start the Celtics game after the Bruins. But yeah, big game five tonight back in Boston. Very excited for that. Uh, Pedro says, great value. Thank you, Pedro. Suzanne, awesome. Um, Mark Harris, good stuff. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. You all have a great weekend. Have a happy Easter. If Easter is something that is important to you and that you celebrate, I wish you all a happy Easter. And this has been another episode of Real Talk with Bill and Michelle. We will be back here again next Friday afternoon. Same bat time, same bat channel, 4 p.m. Eastern. Hope you all have a great weekend and we'll see you all soon. Bye, everybody.